re-record. Yes, this is this is after the, we're unrecording. Yeah. Warning: The Catholic Man Show contains high levels of manliness. If you think you may be too weak to withstand the manliness represented in the following program, please do yourself a favor and stop listening now. If you choose to continue in spite of this warning, if at any time you feel yourself overcome by the manliness, stop immediately and consult your closest medical professional. And now, for the not-so-fair, faint, or frilly, we present The Catholic Man Show. Welcome to the Catholic Man Show. We're on the Lord's team, the winning side. So raise your glass. I was trying to figure out like how to say have a good Holy Week, you know, to the people in Latin. No, just like you in ask, English. You should ask Google Translate. Yeah, because that always works. Yeah, it's been it's hit uh, uh, home runs for us. Every time we've done that. So many times. Um, but I was like, you know, have efficacious Holy Week. No, that doesn't, like, that isn't right. Like, have an intense Holy Week. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know. Like, may you suffer well. Like, maybe a... I mean, it sounds like the question you're asking really is, like, I have wondered the same thing about Lent. Yeah. You know, because it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. You know, like... But spe- specifically for Holy Week, uh-huh. right, as we're entering into the holiest week of the year. I mean, it's like, but it's really a question of uh, a distinction of degrees, not kind. Kind. Right, yes. in what you're, it's like, because if it was true about Lent, it's definitely true, true now. About, yes. Right. And so, like, what did I used to say? I used to say something. I think I used to say, like, maybe it was efficacious, an efficacious yeah. Lent to you. Yeah, but, something. like, that just doesn't hit. You know, it's like, I don't know, like, have a, there, an, an intensely prayerful Holy Week. There was, week. like, for a while, it's like, this is years ago, it's like, kind of down with the happy Lent. Have a happy, happy Lent. And, you know, I hope you do have a happy Lent, but that's not, like, the thing I want to wish you about Lent. Like, the, to me, like, the thing that is essential to Lent isn't that it's, it's happy. happiness. Right, yeah. you know, sort of like Easter would. It's not, it's not Lent's charism. So right, speak. exactly. Yeah, it's not its charism. That's exactly <laughs> right. Whereas Easter, on the other hand, is like joyful, joyous. Yeah, yes. like. Um, so, well, but if I can remember it before the end of the episode, I you'll, will. You'll Im- I will just cut stop, us off. Absolutely halt whatever it is we're saying about saying at the time. Perfect. And just throw it in. Yeah. And we'll see. Okay. And then we can carry on. I'm re- very excited to enter into the Easter season, dude. Me too. I cannot wait. It's going to be so awesome. The beautiful thing about fasting is that you get to feast. You know, there's yeah. there's the seasons of feast. Yeah. And if you fast well, you get to feast well. You know, like feasting, mm-hmm. like it it means more. Yeah. And it's great that we have, I think Palm Sunday is just, you know, the, the church's liturgical calendar is a work of art, I think. We're in the middle of, you know, at the middle of Lent, towards the end of Lent, now entering into the most penitential week of the year. Mm-hmm. But we have Palm Sunday first, which is like the celebration of Jesus entering, tri- you know, triumphantly right. into Jerusalem. Yeah. You know, to like this is a this is a Sunday to really feast uh, um, amidst all Sundays, as we celebrate Christ entering his triumphant, in. um, you know, like entrance into Jerusalem. Yeah, uh, it's like a, a real victory. It's a, a day of victory. Um, so, and that's a beautiful thing to have right here before we go into the mm-hmm. most penitential week of the yeah. year. Yeah. Well, when we commit deicide. Yeah. Which is bad. It's bad. It's a bad. It, it's, it's one of our. Well, ugly- it's not good, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the ugliest marks for humankind. <laughs> well, let's see how it works out for him, Cotton. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man. Okay. So hey, we are bold this, strategy. Bold strategy. Yeah. It turns out it it was uh, it's it seemed like a bad. It seemed like a fail, and then it turned out to be a pretty. You know, like I imagine that's how it was for Satan. Don't you think that Satan thought like as he watched Christ hanging on the cross? Don't you think he thought he was winning, or something? I imagine that that was a yeah, a, probably some yeah. like a big bait and switch. I think on the he, devil, yeah. you know, like when all of a sudden he realized, what he's 
He's back? I was like rooting for him. Like, I, you know, like deceived one of his own right. apostles, his like inner circle, into betraying him and getting him killed. And now. Only to realize that's what's the, that, you know, like, ah! <laughs> Just, now the ga- gates of heaven are all open. Right, yeah. It's like, <laughs> that's a big backfire. That is, yeah. So this evening, you know what's not a big backfire is this whiskey we're having this evening. It's so good. Wyoming whiskey. We've had Wyoming whiskey on the show uh, several times. This is the double cask. I got to tell you, my dad actually asked me, uh, he was going to a friend's house not too long ago, and he said, hey, what's a good bourbon that's not very expensive mm-hmm. to bring over to, the, to their house? And I said, listen, and we get this question a lot from people. They, yeah. they email us or text us or something like that asking us, hey, what, what's a bourbon? Here, here's my go-tos, okay? So for bourbons. If you can find Wyoming whiskey, that's the that's the hard win. to find here in Oklahoma. A little bit, it you can you you it's, can find it. It's but cheap, you know. It's so it's what was 30, this like 35, 35, maybe forty bucks? Yeah, it's under forty dollars for sure. Yeah, and this is the double cask, right? Um, the the regular is even cheaper, mm-hmm. and it's so and smooth. In it's fact, so good. Yeah, so my dad couldn't find Wyoming whiskey because uh, it's hard to find, like you mentioned. Yeah, in other states, the closer you get to Wyoming, Obviously. if you get to, if you're in Wyoming, this is. At every grocery store, it's at every yeah. liquor store, right. and it's like thirty bucks. Yeah, it's really cheap. Um, so I, I told him like Wyoming whiskey is a good one. Seventeen ninety two, I really like. Yeah, uh, it's one that has a great presentation bottle. It's mm-hmm. a cheaper whiskey. The whiskey is good. It's smooth. It's, it doesn't have a harsh right. bite. It's not. It's not like it's not complex. Overly complex, right? But it's but it's good. It's a easy drinking. Right. Yeah, not going to offend anybody. Everyone's going to enjoy it and have right. a good time. Buffalo yeah. Trace is another one. Yeah. Uh, Eagle Rare is another one. You know, there's there's several of them. Anyway, it was really funny because he got there. He brought 1792. He got there. Somebody else had brought a Wyoming whiskey, and so he had a chance to try both. Uh-huh. And he said he really liked the 1792, but he said the Wyoming whiskey was just so smooth. Yeah. Um, and so it really is. And everything I've had from them is all good. Yeah. So every, this is, every single thing. This one is, so again, double cask. It, it's a straight bourbon whiskey finished in sherry casks. So it has a little sweetness at the end there, which is nice because it's, uh, you know, a 50% uh, ABV. Uh, the whiskey gets its color and character from the cask in which it ages and matures. This double cask whiskey goes through the process twice. The first five years in the barrel makes it a bourbon. The sherry cask adds a nice touch of sweetness and brings out the best in the spirit to deliver superior smoothness and drinkability. You can drink it on ice or with a twist and anything nice. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, that is another thing. I don't, I'm not a ice in my whiskey guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you have, every now and then, you want to make a drink. Mm-hmm. And if you all you have are nice scotches and expensive bourbons, you're not going to want to make... Well, you might make an old fashioned out of a nice a nice bourbon, but this is a whiskey that I'm not afraid to. Oh yeah, like m- mix in yeah. a drink whiskey because it soda. just it doesn't cost very much, sure. right? So like sure, whatever. Even though I I always drink it neat and straight, it's, like like a man. It's so good. So we're on the Lord's team, the winning side. So raise your glass. Cheers to Jesus. Cheers. And the last thing I'll say about Wyoming whiskey is it's just kind of a a cool story. Um, it's not like a story of ancient tradition like every single whiskey distiller tries to present themselves right basically it's all made in this tiny town in wyoming and i think they kirby yeah i think they employ like almost the entire town Mm -hmm. like almost everybody there because it's it's a small town works at the distillery um and so it really has become like a local you know everybody's really proud Mm -hmm. of the product that they they should be there yeah so, you you just like to see that, yeah. Uh, big news for the the David Ranch, the Niles Ranch. We have chicks. Yeah. Uh, yes. Just yesterday and today they started hatching. Uh, there are still four eggs that the broody hen is sitting on. We'll see if they hatch. Okay. Um. It's been exciting. Yeah. You know, between having piglets and now baby chicks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did want to ask for prayers because I, if I can borrow a trailer, if if my buddy Robert, uh, who is a loyal, my, he's your we're our buddy Robert, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. one of the best guys. Yeah. Uh, I mean, really, yeah. and he also has a, a nice trailer that he lets me borrow 
anytime I want. And I just text him this evening, like, hey, can I borrow your trailer tomorrow? And I haven't heard back from him yet. But the cattle auction is tomorrow, okay? And if you guys remember the story about the last time I went to the cattle auction. <laughs> the, the hilarious debacle. Yes, um, about trying to trying to buy, I don't know what you call it, deformed is maybe the best most the politically most, correct. The, the politest word yeah. I can think of to describe this cow. But it was really cheap, right? right? Um, so I just would like prayers that I don't humiliate myself again. Or that you do for the sake of your humility. And if I do, if I do humiliate myself, that I get a lot of traction out of it. <laughs> you know, that I, that I really, really lean into it. And like it makes a big difference in my life. And just appreciate Yeah, that it's like something that really helps Brings me you grow. To God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And isn't wasted as just a humiliating moment and a funny story. I'm okay so. with either. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for the Minahans, we, we just had our first flag football uh, scrimmage this week. Oh, all right. Is this uh, I'm the a, coach. in a league? Yeah, we're this in a league. league. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I'm the I'm the head coach. Uh, our our good friend Blake Berger is the assistant coach. Good. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do. The the plays in which we drew it. So I, I got pretty intense. Maybe maybe a little too intense. Some would say. Drew up a lot of plays. All the kids had wristbands. Plays were on the wristbands. Holding them up, telling them like colors. We hadn't practiced yet. The first scrimmage was like the practice. Uh. So there was some frustration on my part. Yeah. Because it seems forgot like, to go over like positions. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, it's just defense. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna work through that, but it should be should be a fun year. Awesome. It was humiliating. It was absolutely humiliating. We got just stomped. Um. It's it'll be a tough year. Nice. Yeah. So it'll be a lot of. So who's on the team? Uh, Luke and Jude, uh-huh. Fitz, uh, and then um, Bowden, the Maddox's boy. Yeah, yeah. And then he's an athlete, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, our four. It sounds, it sounds like those those are pretty good. It drops off dramatically after that. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, drastically, I guess is more. But you know, you're the dramatically coach. drastically. You're you're the coach. You're of course going to say just... that about like your own kid is the most. You know. Uh, you know what? Our first play, Luke uh, ran uh, in for a touchdown. And you thought, we got this. We didn't score again. Well, did you try running that play again? Yeah. Uh, right afterwards, the coach said, uh, you two boys, you, 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 you double team him every play. And that really hurt us. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that was pretty effective strategy. <laughs> yeah. Really, actually, great coaching on his part. Yeah. Didn't really see that coming. Not sure uh, if we got outplayed or outcoached. <laughs> Don't really know. A little bit of both, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> I was a little bit surprised. <laughs> you can do that. Yeah. Especially with this being five on five. You guys know what a double team is? Yeah. Yeah, with five on five, it's like somebody is open. Yeah. I know. Can you throw the ball? We can. Hmm. The question is can you catch the ball? <laughs> You can catch the ball. Will you catch the ball? Yeah. We had one, we had one dude, we had one kid. Bless his heart. Like you can tell, like he's never played sports. Okay, but he got there. Right. Like, but he's here. He's here. He's here. I'm, we were excited. Yeah. Like, we, I wanted to get. I wanted him let's, to, to like. Let's get some wins. Yeah, I wanted like especially at the end when it was like we were getting just crushed. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it's like I just wanted to get him. Let's the get ball. A, find a small victory. Yeah, and man, I we were trying, and it was, it just it just wasn't working out yet. We have to. We need to come up with something. So I know I know that kid. Yeah. Uh you know, I used to coach basketball. I coached my little sister's team. Yeah. With my my dad and I coached when she was uh little. And and I also helped out well actually I didn't. I didn't help him coach my brother's team. But I remember did I help him coach it? I think I actually did help at the very end. Anyway, there was a kid on the team who was um Built for the chessboard, yeah, not the basketball court, right? But he was on the team, you know. We're excited about, yeah. It's like, hey, like, good. This would be good for you, yeah. And then one time in one game, he did catch a pass, yeah. Okay, so 
didn't happen a whole lot that he like anybody passed him the ball. Right, but he okay. did this for whatever reason. Someone passed him the ball and he caught it. Usually, when he would catch it, he would immediately walk. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and just turn the ball over, which is why he didn't get a lot of passes. Sure. In this case, he caught the ball, and I don't remember if the ref was just generous <laughs> by not. But and a, a defender immediately was on him, and he just launched it up into the air, off the backboard, and into the goal. Or, you know, he scored. And it was just like, everybody is like exploded, like, yeah. ah, mm-hmm. he made it. And then he sat back down afterwards, and he looked at my dad. He goes, Coach, I think I found my sport. <laughs> and my dad, my dad <laughs> still laughs about that line to this day. It's like, really? <laughs> What is it? (laughs) You've been playing some soccer on the side? (laughs) Is it like dodgeball? (laughs) After this game is over, I would love to to hear what it is. You know, it was just really funny. Okay, you ready? Uh, Yeah, let's do it. I do have one more story I want to tell about the St. Patrick's Day party at St. Benedict. Okay. Even though it wasn't there. Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles. Here with Adam Minahan, we're drinking a delicious Irish bourbon. <laughs> I'm just kidding, obviously. But I did want to talk about the St. Patrick's Day party we threw at St. Benedict's here in Broken Era. It was a rager. It was. It was awesome. A ton of people there. Yes. Uh, this is, I, want to, I just want to tell, this is a hilarious story, so I just wanted to share it. I wasn't part of this conversation, but it was relayed to me by my father. He's a very trustworthy man, yes. okay? Except when he tells <laughs> stories, usually. <laughs> but in this case, I'm pretty sure, as one who is, has a lifetime of experience curating truth from falsehood, amidst his stories I'm pretty sure this one's true Father John O'Neill mm-hmm. good Irish uh, Catholic priest we have here in the Diocese of Tulsa in eastern Oklahoma he was there playing some music yes so he was sitting there talking to some other priests and they were like just joking with each other about how like their own like ability to bless and one of the priests made the comment like oh man I, I don't know if mine makes it much further than like 10 feet and uh you know, like, oh, just, you know, I just can't do it. I mean, 10 feet, that's about my max as far as I can. Bless. My blessing just doesn't reach further than that. And another guy was like, I think mine goes like probably 30 yards. And then Father John O'Neill was like, you guys got to work on this. Mine goes a long way. I mean, like hundreds and hundreds of yards. And he actually said, like, watch. And there was a, he pointed to a guy way far away. Uh-huh. And he's like, watch this. And he made the sign of the cross and like blessed him. And as soon as he did, the dude fell over. (laughs) 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 And they all just like lost it, you know, like, that's awesome. Like, you're right. I do need to step this up. Talk about like, don't you wish you were there to see that happen? Like, watch, you know, make the sign of the cross and just dude falls over. Also, shout out to our daughters who did. A superb job. Yeah, they were the highlight of the show. Uh, uh, of Irish dancing at the, at the dude. Anna, Bridget. Anna is looking good. Like her form, she's, she's getting there. Yeah, uh, she's, like yeah. she is. Uh, I hadn't seen her dance since when, kind of when we got started. Yeah, and so like the other day when when I was there, like man, she's she's picking it up. Like she looks like an Irish dancer. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she's picking it up. She definitely has better like posture. The, and it's a lot of it is in the posture. Especially in Irish dance, like in, in spo- Irish dance specifically, to, like, yeah, it, the postures were very key, right? Because right. they weren't supposed to be like Irish dance kind of became a thing because they weren't allowed to dance, mm-hmm. and so they, so you know, yeah. they, they couldn't move their hands around as they're as they're dancing, so they always kept their because it was there were penal laws established that actually forbade dancing, right? right. And so they they ended up they, well, there, there are several theories about the development of Irish dance. One, this one says that. They developed a style of dance that made it look like they weren't dancing. Right. Very upright. Yes. I'm, I'm not dancing. I'm just kicking my feet. You right. Know? It's almost like you'd have plausible deniability. Were you dancing? Did it look like I was dancing? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I'm I was doing? I'm not sure what you were doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, 
someday maybe if they're listening to our show years down the road which i think they will we're very proud of you if they don't listen to our show someday then what are we even doing th- then they're bad children <laughs> taking you out of the will yeah uh, okay, you want to get into the oh yes. oh before we do really fast just uh, real quick we have a lot of things going on uh, for our Patreon that we're doing indeed. Um, and, indeed. And if you guys listened to that last week's episode we're giving away uh, prayer candles ten inch tapered prayer candles hundred percent beeswax by Ambrosian candles the first fifty uh, patrons ten dollars more a month will receive that on top of everything else that we give including these Catholic Mantra Glen Karen glasses which are awesome um, and so dishwasher safe. And one of the yeah, uh, La- with they're, lasers, la- they're laser etched with, with lasers. Lasers, yeah. Um, and then we're also having a ask a theologian on our uh, every week on our Patreon account uh, on our Patreon account. Mm-hmm. Like, so if you have questions about the Catholic faith and want to know, we have a, a a theologian that's dedicating at least an hour a week to answer yeah. questions and give like resources. And here's how. Here's more reading. Like here's things that you're going to be reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can His read. His name's him. Dr. Aaron Henderson. Mm-hmm. He's a Thomist. Yes. And he's a brilliant, he's a young guy, mm-hmm. uh, brilliant. His, uh, he is so good about ex- giving very complicated answers in a way it's that any, anybody can understand. Yeah. So I'm really excited about that. And then we're also building out uh, study guides for Peeper books, for Joseph Peeper books. Yeah. So we have a lot of things uh, in the pipeline for our patrons. So if you go to patreon.com slash the Catholic Man Show, you can support our show. We'd love the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. And, and, and um, you know, we're, we're trying to build up our Patreon, Patreon account to where we all learn more about the faith and learn, learn more about the church and ultimately learn more about our Lord. I want to do that. So uh, anyway, okay, so tonight we're, uh, I wanted to, to talk about the agony in the garden. I wanted to talk about Jesus and the agony in the garden. I thought it was fitting being that we're in Holy Week. Uh, the agony in the garden has always, for me, like been the most real for me really? okay. out of his whole passion. Like, um, yeah. even when you're, I'm praying the Sorrowful Mysteries, the Rosary, like, the, like that mystery is the one that's actually the most real to me. Hmm. Um. It's a, it's that's, see for me the, I would say that's the scourging, the scourging is very yeah is the, like, yeah it's but like uh, the scourging is absolutely um, re, like easy to meditate on because you almost like feel it like as you're yeah but I think the suffering involved in the scourging is the most excessive like I think it's the most understandable this like this the what the profundity of the suffering in the agony of the garden is just less a it's less apparent right um even like the carrying of the cross is something that you have to think about a lot more before you like really mm. come to like oh what that suffering really is yeah that's and int- i've never been crucified right so that one's also not you know i have to really use my imagination so but, do you think that uh the intensity of suffering lies more in a physical suffering or oh, it- no no not no certainly um, for Christ, it was it was, I don't know if you'd call it mental. I would maybe mental suffering, but um, an emotional suffering. Like tonight, we're talking about the agony in the garden. To me, the agony. I think the closest analogy I can come to in my life is been um, that moment when like you maybe if, if you if, if like someone breaks up with you or like you, a relationship ends that you don't want to. You know, mm-hmm. you have this intense love for somebody else. Mm-hmm. who is rejecting you mm-hmm. and just the the heartache that that brings along to me that i kind of think about that as a good you know ba- like st- dipping your baby toe in the water of what is good. the agony in the garden because i think christ's suffering in that moment was i mean and we'll get into it tonight because it's it's not just one thing but mm-hmm. um a lot of it was him holding the entirety of his creation in his mind mm-hmm. with an an infinite love for every single one of them and just being bitterly aware in that moment in a special way about every single one who would reject him. Mm-hmm. And his suffering was born out of his love for those people, and myself included, because I have, I've, I have been that man. Mm-hmm. 
far too many times, you know, just how much he loves us in that moment mm-hmm. amidst that total rejection. Isn't it interesting how love and suffering, the intensity of, like of both, like intensifies the other? Yeah. That there's like the more that you can love something, the more that you know there's more suffering involved. The more you suffer something, the more you can love something. Right. Yeah, it increases your capacity for both. Yeah, as and you it, grow. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Um, one of the things that I always thought that's of, why I like the cross. The cross right. is always involved in love. Right. Because if you do love someone, you're basically bringing the cross more and more into your life. Now maybe that person won't wound you, but um, the person you're loving is not perfect, and so they. Mm-hmm. eventually they will in small ways or big ways you know so the more yeah but the more you love and that's why people that's why you know and everybody knows people like this who just close themselves off right yeah right which is so sad and which is which is um a defense mechanism and you know I, I don't think that they always are choosing to do it but that is not the christian life right the christian life calls us to uh, embrace that cross and embrace the suffering that comes along with a deeper and deeper love for everyone. That's right. Yeah, so as we're in a Holy Week, uh, I, I think there's a couple things that you can do to kind of make your Holy Week more efficacious or more intense or how, whatever the word is that we're, we're, or phrase yeah. we're going to use. One being that you should watch The Passion of the Christ, maybe with your beloved. Yeah. Uh, I think that's always something, that, that's something that Haley and I do every year for, for Holy Week. Yeah. Uh, and it really brings home, it really... Uh, creates this like here's what really happened mm-hmm. um but another thing is obviously to to read the gospels especially the passion right so if you have matthew mark and luke all focus on uh, ha- have a different type of of narrative so to speak than john does right so john typically focuses more on the divinity of jesus uh-huh. matthew, matthew mark yeah. and luke typically focus on on kind of the human aspect or the the um the divine and the human aspect of Jesus, but John is really focused on the divine aspect yeah. of Jesus, right? It's pretty clear that John had the, I mean, he had the other gospels when he was writing his. Right. Yeah. And so it was in many ways in a, an addition, you know, like a, mm-hmm. like, here, let me, let me, now that you know this, let me, let me add the, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Add to it. Build on pawn. Right. So, um, so one, some of the things to, to think about. So let's let's go through. So so Jesus is now he, he's gone through the Passover, right? And so one of the things I, I was reading about uh, uh, preparing for this is you know at the Passover, the the small tea tradition of this that where the Passover happened is actually where Mark was Mark's house, his parents' house. His yeah. par- or it was his parents. I thought yeah. it was his house. It was his parents' house. I mean, okay. it became his house, his um, family's house, his family's house. Yeah, which was uh, very interesting, right? Um, yeah. But when we get back, so I want to like kind of enter into like what it was the garden. Uh, him, he was entering into it. Was he afraid of death? Did he fear death? Uh, things to talk about on the other side of the break. We'll be right back. Both and it's both and. It's a trick question. Don't fall for it, people. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. Hope this Holy Week provides you many graces upon you and your family. We're talking about the agony in the garden, talking about you know the, the beginning, basically of of the passion of Jesus entering into his passion. Uh, it starts with the Passover, obviously. We just talked about it on the other side of the break. A redemptive Lent to you. A redemptive That's Lent. what I used to say. Nice. It's just thinking there was. about it. A redemptive Lent. A redemptive Lent for you. Nice. So before the break, we were talking about how the Passover... That went exactly as I said it would. <laughs> which I don't think anybody <laughs> thought, oh, no, there's, there's no way he's going to do it that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, we were talking about like you know, the Passover started. It was actually... You know, the small T tradition that it was in Mark's parents' house. Yeah. Uh, one of the writers of the Gospels. Uh, and uh, so he, he he enters into, he has the Passover, and he enters into uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, mm-hmm. and the, the Mount of Olives, right? Um, and so, so a lot of this is I'm actually pulling from, say, Thomas Aquinas in his, all of his wisdom, he, he 
one of the things he did was he has the Katana uh, Katana Aria. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Uh, and, and basically, what it is is his commentary on the Gospels, and all he does is he pulls from the Church Fathers and the right. early early <coughs> Church saints. It's uh, like on the commentaries on on the Gospels. The Katana Aria. If you have only like a few books to have, mm-hmm. okay. Obviously the 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 Bible, okay, and then. The Catena Aurea is this, it's a gem that like no people don't ever talk about. Mm-hmm. But like you said, it's compiled by St. Thomas. Mm-hmm. What he thought, these are the most important things that the church fathers have said. So it's... Or, or early church saints. Or yeah, or other, yeah, exactly. But it's mostly like heavily church fathers. Right. He put it together from these things that they said uh, so it's not his commentary. It's, it's not even his commentary. He, but he did compile it. He did curate, you know, right. and decide. And it's beautiful. It's incredible. Yeah. And so, like, this is, you know, like the Summa is great. The Gospels are better. Mm-hmm. You know. Okay. And so, like, this is the best. Well, there's a lot of great commentaries on Gospels out there sure. um, that you know might be actually more helpful today because like we lose a lot about the culture. But anyway, the Catena Aurea. I think everyone should have it. Yeah, and so it's really great. So I, I'm pulling a lot, like, I studied it a, a lot uh, this week trying to uh, understand going into uh, the agony in the garden and what the early church father said, what the saints said, and pulling it to try to try to maybe dispel some of the some of the things you, you would think are the case about the agony in the garden. Uh-huh. And, and maybe like, oh, that, I didn't really take that angle from it, right? Yeah, sure. Because uh, we've talked about this on the show before, but you know, there's four ways to read the Bible, right? We had had a, a conversation with Deacon Harrison Garlic on this, right? The yeah. literal, the allegorical, the moral, and the anagogical, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, there's it, the more that you can read into Scripture, and the more you can pull out, and the more you can uh, pull from other sources, right? The more it becomes alive, right? Yeah. So there's always four answers to what does this passage mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so 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 Jesus enters into the garden, um, and Saint Bede says that he talks about how this place is somewhere he could easily be found, right? Because he's been there many times. In fact, it, it's quoted in the Gospels mm-hmm. that he, he goes there many times to actually teach. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was sort of a rendezvous spot for him. Right. So remember, Jesus knows that he's entering into the Passion. He knows that Judas has already left. He knows that Judas is going to be coming back and turning him in. Uh huh. And so he's not going to a place. That's difficult for him to find, like to to kind of hide. He's right. going to a place that, like, uh, people have seen him there a lot. Mm-hmm. Thousands of people have seen him there teaching, preaching. So it's not somewhere conspicuous, right? Right. Yeah. Um. But Saint uh, Christendom says that that it was uh, his practice to pray apart from from everybody else, right? From his apostles, from even his closest people. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, and and this time, of course, he did take uh, Peter, James, and John, and then, but then further went even. But further. then, yeah, but then he, yeah, you're right. He even go, but apart from that, there's a lot of moments in the gospel where he goes by himself, right, to pray. Um, and and Saint Chrysostom says that this is teaching us to study, and in quiet and retirement of our prayers, right. So even uh, in, in Saint uh, Damascene, he talks about this as well as like the importance of. Uh, when you are stressed, when there is a lot of anxiety, the importance of removing yourself from from everybody yeah. else and, and offering that up to our Lord. I think this is also just one of those things about the great, the mystery of the hypostatic union, the fact that Christ is fully man, fully divine, right? Mm-hmm. He, he's not a human person. He's a divine person, mm-hmm. but he was fully, he took on a human nature and he was fully human. And so, um, that's why he is the exemplary example, right? He's the example of examples for us as men, because there is a temptation to be like, well, sure, Christ did this, but I don't walk on water, you know? So therefore I'm not like, what, I'm not going to pay attention to what he does, but that's the wrong attitude um, because he even goes apart to pray. And so that I think that tells us something about our own nature. In my own experience teaches me that if I'm with other people, while I'm praying, depending on who those people are and their ability to be quiet. Right. Okay. And and actually, like, essentially what it is is how good are you at making it so I forget you're here? Right. You know, like, because if we're praying, it's not about you. Right. Uh, 
so like really having that quiet prayer um yeah even jesus needed it that's the thing he's god and, and even he needed it and and especially in in times where you know we see this throughout the gospels where he knew he was going to be preaching to a lot of people or he knew he was going to enter into a lot of uh trial and tribulation like about to you know through lent going into the desert you yeah. know uh, obviously, at this point as well, going into the agony in the garden, so he he makes sure to set an example for us that in time, like there are going to be times in which we're going to have high stress, we're going to have high anxiety, yeah, we're not going to know what to do. But the thing to do, because this is why this is a beautiful part about the hypostatic union, right? About the Word made flesh, is that he is the manifestation of man, mm-hmm. uh, of what the the excellence of man is, yeah. and so like he is what we should be. Christ reveals man to himself and makes his supreme calling clear. Clear, right? Um, and so, anyway, so he, he gives us this example uh, to uh, for us to use, right? Yeah. So, uh, one of the things I actually thought that was very interesting as well that uh, Thomas right uh, includes in this commentary is is from a, a Benedictine monk monk of the ninth century. I think I looked it up, and I think this is how you pronounce it is. Uh, Remig, uh, remig, remigius, I think is how you actually say it. I thought it was going to be rem something, but it's like it's not re- remig- it's not remigius. No, remigius. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, that's how. I, Who knows? I, anyway, you know what? We could say how we could we could say a lot of most of his. Nobody my, knows. My understanding is most of his writings did not make it. Like, so we don't have it uh, okay. other than what Thomas ha- has kept. Now, I could be wrong there, but that's just that's just what I think. Uh, okay. Some of the some of the. Uh, the the work that I, but he says he's talking about this. So he says he had accepted that his disciples' faith and his their devout uh, devoutedness of their will, but he foresaw that they would be troubled and scattered abroad. Right, so he knew like you know the shepherd would be would hit and his flock would scatter. Like Christ says, right, and therefore bade them to sit still in their places in the agony in the garden, for to sit belongs to one at ease. But they would be grievously troubled that they would have, uh, they should have denied him, and so he was talk. He's talking about like, hey, because this is what Jesus does, right? In the agony, he brings the three, the Peter, James, and John, and says, "Sit here and pray, while I go over here and pray." And he goes basically, basically a stone throw away is what the gospel says. Yeah. And, and and prostrates himself, throws his face down on the ground to pray, but he tells them to sit still and pray. Which I thought was so Benedictine, right? Because one of their charisms is stability. Stability, yeah. Um, but how true is it that the man who is at ease, the man who is who is at peace, is pretty still? They're not, fit, they're not moving around. Sure. Yeah. Totally. Um, so I just thought that was kind of a, a beautiful. The the Lord knew that he they were about to be scattered, that they were but their faith was about to be shaken, and so he, what did he do? He gave them this last minute lesson mm-hmm. to sit still and pray. Right here. Yeah, you know, he's, like, and what he's saying here, he's very much aware of their shortcomings, um, just whether physically or whatever. I mean, think about this. At this point, these these disciples, with the exception of Judas, they're passionately in love with with Christ. You can see it in Peter, like, saying, no, if you die, I'm I'm dying with you. I'm going with you. Right. Like, Like, no way, like, I'm ready. I am ready to die, and with you can just feel the fervor in in that in in his in him when he says that. Um, and so, right after that, they're going across to pray, and Jesus is sweating bullets. Like if he has ever looked bad, mm-hmm. this is the moment he the he has. I don't know what he looked like after he came back from fasting for forty days. I imagine he looked like. He had to look rough. Yeah, maybe a little rough. Okay, yeah. but in this moment, he's sweating blood. Okay, okay, hold on. Let's not get to that point yet. But I just want to. My point is that they even they couldn't even stay awake, even seeing his distress, knowing what was mm-hmm. about to happen, because it wasn't okay. Like Christ has been telling them for a long time now, over and over and over and over again, "I'm going to Jerusalem to die." Okay, these three were on. They were there at the Transfiguration, okay? And they know very specifically why they're here, Mm -hmm. so that Christ is going to die. And now here he is in, like, his worst moment, 
and they can't even stay awake. Yeah. Okay. What's very interesting is that's the literal read of it. Uh, some of the church fathers have a, a really beautiful, uh, more moral reading of this. Yeah. Well, um, I only bring that up to talk about what you said here is about. He was very he was very aware of their shortcomings. He knew their devotedness, but their inability to yeah to deal with everything. Right. So he he gets it. Yeah. So uh, we're going to talk about Jesus starting to pray and if Jesus feared his death on the other side of the break. Mm. Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles. Here with Adam Minahan. Everyone else has abandoned us. I look to the left. There is no one. To the right, I am surrounded by foes. My bones are racked. There was no one to ease my pain. No Juan Posada. No, no Jimbo Jim Baggins. Spin. No, no Jimbo Baggins. I am, utterly, I am utterly crushed. So we're talking about the agony of the garden. We're talking about... Was that pretty good? That, that was, was pretty good. good. Thank you. Yeah, that was pretty good. Because we're here all by ourselves. Yeah. That's, what that. I'm trying to say is <laughs> it's just us. Nobody else is here. <laughs> That's my Lint, the Linton version of <laughs> he's saying, nobody else is here. <laughs> so we're talking about uh, Jesus in the agony of the garden. So um, St. Cyril, he talked about how, you know, again, Jesus, G, the, the important part of Jesus r- removing himself, even from his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John, from a cast, cast uh, a stone's cast away, which is in Luke's gospel. It's funny because uh, the other gospels don't actually mention how far away. Mm-hmm. Um, so is this like a sand wedge? I would imagine more of a, a lob wedge. Yeah, like yeah, you know, like maybe a, a fifty-six degree or like yeah, something like that. Maybe roughly 50, fifty-eight. Yeah, in the rough. Yeah. Okay. Out of the rough. Yeah. Gotcha. That makes more sense to me. Yeah. I don't throw a lot of stones. Okay. <laughs> right. Um. So again, so they they really uh wanted to to talk about and like it, it make sure people understood like the importance of Jesus going alone to pray. Like that, it's important for all of us, right, mm-hmm. to, to to do this. I feel like we say this a lot on our podcast, but your prayer life is like the most essential thing about your life. Yeah, your that relationship you have with God, numero uno. Numero uno. Okay, like so, it's you should really do it good. Try try hard. So uh, before the break, you, you're talking about, uh, or we said like, did Jesus fear his death? I'm gonna say this is cheating, but I I think it's yes and no. I think it's both. Okay. I think on a human level, it's, it's only natural for you to be to fear death. Mm-hmm. Death is an abomination. Mm-hmm. It's a result of sin. Mm-hmm. That is why Jesus had to bear it. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I think on a divine level, the answer is no. Um, I, I know mm-hmm. it's just in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, and mm-hmm. which is not, I get, this is not biblical, uh, you know, but that scene where um, he's being handed the cross and he embraces it. Mm-hmm. I just think I really love that scene of Christ embracing his cross, mm-hmm. loving it, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because he loves us, you know. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's both. Yes, he feared death and and no, he didn't fear death. Yeah. So the body naturally has an inclination to not have the body soul removed from one another. Yeah. Right. And so there's an anxiety that happens there. Yeah. But. I think that you can train. I mean, obviously, you can train your body to you know, train train yourself yeah. to not be worried about that, right? And we see this in with martyrs, right? For, for greater can. love, yeah. Um, and we should all be trying to do that. Yes, and so most of like, interestingly, most of the 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 saints talk about it. That, like, it's a false pretense to think that Jesus feared his death. Really? Yeah. Okay. So let me let me say. So Saint John Chrysostom, who was uh, early church. Like the very early church, saying John yeah, Christian, yeah, right? So yeah. he says uh, he's talking about uh, people who thought that he was refusing his passion and like, d- like not wanting to die, or having fear of death. He says, uh, "Nor says he this as refusing his passion, for he who rebuked a disciple who wished to prevent his passion, so as even uh, after many condemnations to call him Satan, how should he be unwilling to be crucified?" So remember, he just told Peter, "Get away from me, Satan." Yeah. Because Peter was basically telling him, "Like Lord, don't, don't go be crucified. Don't do this." 
Right. And, and he says, get away from me, Satan. Yeah. That line that he says, he says, get thee behind me, Satan, is a really beautiful line. You know, it's just one of the things that we miss in English that in Hebrew is very present. When a disciple, when a, like a master, like Jesus or a rabbi was going, like when he would accept a disciple, he would tell them, get thee behind me. Basically saying, follow me, mm -hmm. follow my ways, follow, like f come and learn from me. So when he says, get thee behind me, he's, re he's reminding Peter, follow me. Hmm. He's, it's a, it's one, it's not only a rebuke, it is a rebuke, but it's, also simultaneously an encouragement to say remember peter remember why right. you, remember why we're here remember yeah. what your life is about it's about following me what i do you will also do which is also a foreshadowing of peter's own death yeah yeah upside it's, down it's it's a it's a really that particular line is a, is beautiful when you once again if you don't study the scriptures right. from people who know these things cuz i don't know hebrew right. like i only know that particular thing cuz talk to somebody mm -hmm. um then it's like man that kind of thing really unlocks a lot of a lot of beauty absolutely yeah and so just to make sure that you you don't think that we're just pulling one quote right so let me let's go to a doctor of the church saint okay. hillary one that we don't really talk about very much we you and i we have a book uh we just bought uh you and i both just bought a book of saint hillary's writings and mm -hmm. i really want to dive into it to, to talk more about him as a doctor of the church and just bring some I of mean, his writings I don't know. Out. I think there's probably a. It might even be the majority of Catholics think Saint Hilary is a girl. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but he was known as the hammer, uh, hammer of Arian, which is too bad, right? Because his name is Hilary. Yeah. And to us today, but it's in like, Latin, his name really means like happiness or cheerfulness. Cool. So anyway, he, that's here, cool. Here's what he talks about uh, regarding people who think about the fear of the passion uh, and, and death of our Lord. He says, "I ask those who think this." Whether it stands with reason that he should have feared to die or banished from the apostles all fear of death or extorted them to the glory of martyrdom, and if his passion was to do him honor, how could he fear of his passion make him sorrowful? How could, how the, could, fear of how could the fear of, of his passion make him sorrowful? Yeah, I don't know. And I guess it depends on what, what we mean by fear. When I was thinking fear, I was like, Maybe fear is not the thing I was thinking of exactly. Um, I was really thinking more of like a desire for it not to happen, which really isn't fear. That's not the same thing as, as mm -hmm. fear. Mm -hmm. So maybe I should... Well, it's okay. I'll let it go. It doesn't matter. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, so he brought... Like we said, uh, he, he brought... He had forwarded them, uh, bringing Peter, James, and John uh, with him, right? And he began to be sorrowful. Therefore, he was not sorrowful uh, till he, 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 because he took them, but he, he was all fear. Uh, I'm sorry. But all his fear began after he had taken them with him so that his, his agony was not for himself, but for those he had taken with him. So again, this, th this reference is, is really right before then we, we hear in the gospel that the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. Will be scattered, which, yeah. He said, so that the pro the the prophecy may be fulfilled. Right. right. Yeah, and so, like, he's, something. he's so, uh, his sorrow is for the, for the sheep without a shepherd. Mm -hmm. For his, for, for his, cre which is something he has said previously in the Gospels already. Yeah. About when he sees, I, I think it's after the, like, at the right before the feeding of it's either the three thousand or the five thousand, I don't remember. But he was he saw them and was sorrow he was sorrowful because they were like a, sh a sh they were like sheep without a shepherd. Right. And so he feeds them all. Yeah. Um, Saint John Dam uh, Damascus says, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, did say that he had a natural fear and sorrow for death, but uh. For, for there is a natural fear with for the sh the soul shrinks from the separation from the body right which is what we just talked about yeah yeah but 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 by reason of, of that close sympathy implanted from the first of by the maker of all things so it's so he's talking about again we have the creator of all things mm -hmm. you know, ma word made flesh yeah now 
uh, struggling. The logos. The logos, right. The word that was spoken that brought forth existence. Yeah, and here's here's something like so it says. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to John Saint John Damascus for like really like backing me up. He's. Yeah. I feel like what he said was backing me up. There. Here, here's something about human nature that I think is really funny that he that Saint John says here. Wherefore the passions of our uh, of our nature were in Christ both in in nature and beyond nature, right? Natural and supernatural. Yeah. By nature, because he he left his flesh to suffer the things incidental to it. Beyond nature or supernaturally, because these natural emotions did not uh, precede him to, uh, and his will, right? They didn't so, come before his will. They, they didn't, didn't yeah, come, like, yeah, interfere with his in, will. Interfere with his will. Because for in Christ, nothing befell of compulsion. Christ was not a compulsive person. Right. Uh, but it was all voluntary. With, with his will, he hungered. With his will, he feared or was sorrowful. That's the thing about Christ is that when you when you actually think about oh his uh voluntariness versus his compulsion in the end they become the same because he wills it so much what the father wills he's volunteering like uh in latin the word volo means i will um something we say at our house a lot like volo i will like it's just fun Fun, fun homeschool culture right there. Um, <laughs> really making a, yeah. a a good mark for a homeschool. Co- homeschool, yeah. You know, like anyway, um, his voluntariness was so um, was so perfect that like to distinguish it between compulsion is difficult to do. Okay, like he does what the father wills, mm-hmm. um, and it almost seems compulsory, but only because it's so voluntary. Right. Yeah, Saint Jerome, master you know, uh, uh, of you know the Bible and yeah. biblical commentary, he talks about that his soul, his sorrowfulness was not because of death, but unto death, which is what we read right in in the Gospels. Mm-hmm. That it wasn't because of death, but unto death, until he had set the apostles free by his passion. So it was not that his sor- his soul was sorrowful of death, but unto death. Yeah, which I think is a very a, important. That, that is a good distinction. Yeah. So uh, we're out of time on Catholic Radio, I believe. Or is, do we have one more, or is this it? Okay. Uh, go check us out on the podcast, and we're going to continue talking about uh, what does it mean when the apostles fell asleep, and what did the mm-hmm. church fathers th- think about that? We're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So read your glass. So Saint Jerome talks about uh, you know so Jesus goes and prays. He comes. I, I do like. I, of course, I've always read this. My soul is sorrowful unto death. Yeah. You know, and I really, really like the Douay Rheims style of things. This is kind of like, it's got mm-hmm. the word unto. Mm-hmm. I know this isn't from the Douay Rheims, but still it says that. That does get a little bit confusing sometimes because to me, when I see that, I just, I can't make that distinction. It's not as clear to me because of the language, even mm-hmm. though it sounds cooler, mm-hmm. that it's not sorrowful to death but unto, unto death. death, which is a big distinction, which when you point it out, I can appreciate the distinction, yeah. but it's not something that jumps out at me when I read it. Right. So Jesus goes again, we're at the agony. We're at, we're at the garden. He goes, he brings Peter, James and John. He tells them to sit down and pray. He goes and, and prostrates himself. He comes back and there's, uh, they're asleep. Right. Yeah. Um, three times. Th- yeah. Three times. But, uh, Saint, uh, Saint Jerome talks about this. He says, "Did they sleep?" He says, "He would have uh, have them forgo not bodily rest, for which is a critical time here. Because remember, there's no room for this. There's no time for this. They know that he's about to enter into his passion. Yeah, yeah, right. So there's no, uh, but it, it's a it, it's a sleep of unbelief. Hmm. So so a lot of the the, the saints talk about this in Origin as well. Talks about this that it's not necessarily them falling asleep." From a physical standpoint, but it's a, remember the holy the, the holy spirit it, has not, it has not could been, have been. I think it probably was that too. Again, there's a literal, but we're talking right, exactly. a, a little bit more, you know, further on. But I don't. But it's not that they didn't physically fall asleep. But that's not right. the most important element here that uh, at least Origen is is speaking about right now. Yeah. So, he, but they talk about like uh, remember that the holy spirit has not descended upon them yet, right? You know, so they've not had. Yeah. Uh, their their supernatural virtues have not been yeah, they're strengthened. Not, they're not like fully awake yet, right? And so this is the sleep of unbelief. 
and this is the problem this is what some of the the saints talk about like this is the reason why peter actually denies our, our lord three times and this is why the apostles scatter and they get frightened is because like they actually have not had the holy spirit descend upon them and strengthen their faith uh-huh. which i thought was, was was very interesting but when when he comes back and he sees them asleep uh, Guardini, Romero, Romero Guardini talks about this in The Lord. Have you ever read that book before? It's, it's no. big. Uh-uh. It's beautiful. I've not read all of it, but I've read parts of it. He talks about this uh, there. He says, this is uh, truth realized in charity. And not truth like, but capital T truth. Like this is yeah. him yeah. realized in charity that all of his loved ones, all of his closest friends mm-hmm. have have departed from like have fallen asleep mm-hmm. yeah and once again that's I, I think you know each one of these stations of the cross mm-hmm. you know these the agony in the garden this is certainly part of it yeah you know and I think that the apostles are the example for us all right that he is suffering what is his suffering here it's rejection mm-hmm. and even those closest to him his best friends mm-hmm. even they have fallen asleep. like even they haven't stayed stayed with him mm-hmm. so to speak right yeah uh, you know and so like that's us with him you know we, we're all we're all on this journey with him yeah right that we're his companions through life mm-hmm and every single one of us have have done that. Yep. Right. And and I think that's part of the big I just really love Peter, especially the Gospel of Mark. I mean, if I had to pick favorites, the, the Gospel of Mark is my least favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, just because it's it's kind of blunt, short, get to the you know, there it just like just goes boom, 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 like one thing to the next, and it's kind of like, whoa. Right. That was all fast. But what I really like about it is that it <clears throat> most likely written by Peter or heavily influenced by Peter and you get to see a lot of Peter's. So that's like his shortcomings are always very Very, present. Yeah. Right. That he wanted to make sure because, you know, by the time he's writing it, he's a much different man and he's like putting all of his problems right out there, out there for everyone to see. And I just really appreciate Peter because he's just the, like these passionate guy. He's somebody that the, the, like the personality of Peter is a lot more on the surface. You know, you can really get to know him mm-hmm. more than the other gospels. Uh, St. John is also one of the guys you can kind of get to know pretty well. Yeah. But Peter, he's just this, like, you just, you know him, right? Yeah. And uh, you know people like him. Mm-hmm. And it's like... He's and you very, see yourself in him a yes, lot. He's very blue collar, uh, just like passionate, like, yes, He's like a guy who's going to do the work. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak a lot of times. Right. He's like, oh, all we have to do is work hard. Okay. Yeah, we can work hard. Sure. Yeah. You know, like that kind of guy. Right. Um, you know, like you see here at the end. It's like, oh, no, I'm going to die. Yeah. Totally. You're dying. I'm, I'm totally dying. And then, you know, like he's so relatable because like an hour later. Right. He's or asleep. close to it. I don't know how yeah. long it is, but it, not that long. Yeah. You know? So Jesus sees them asleep. He goes back. So he, he, tra- he wakes them up. He goes back and prays again, right? And this is when Jesus says, you know, tells the Father, thy will be done. Mm-hmm. Right? And St. Saint, Saint Leo the Great has this beautiful saying, and I, this is very, like, I hope this rings. I hope this hits with other guys because it, it hit hard with me. He says, uh, in reference to thy will be done, he says, let all the sons of the church then utter this prayer. That when the pressure of some mighty temptation lies upon us, they may embrace endurance of the suffering, disregarding its terrors. Totally, man. I um I have to do this sometimes. Sometimes in, in my prayer, I will be confronted with a fear that is unrational. For mm-hmm. instance. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like, for instance, sometimes... This happened to me not too long ago. I'm just praying and, you know, telling the Lord, you know, whatever you want for my life, I do too. Sign me up. Mm-hmm. I'm here. Mm-hmm. What, you're like, is there a permission slip? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm signing it, whatever it is. And then the thought occurs, which I know is a temptation. What if he asked you to sell your house, sell everything you own, give it to the poor, 
and like live in a shack with all your, you know, like it's like basically everything that you really love about you, you know, all these mm-hmm. things you, you love about your life. Right. What if that's what he wanted? Mm-hmm. Would you still do it? Are you still, are you still like Mr. Sign me up, Mr. Permission slip guy? So you still right. that same guy, right. you know, and I have to, I, obviously it's like, I'm afraid of that. Right. I don't want to do that. Right. Um, so there are just moments like that in life where I have to say and remind myself, and it's an, an actually an intellectual exercise amidst a prayer or whatever, where you say, okay, I know that God is good. Mm-hmm. And I know that the things that he wants for my life, whatever they are, they will be the best things. Yeah. And so, yes, even if that's what it is. Now, if that's what it is, Lord, you're going to have to like, you're gonna have to make it abundant. Like I'm not just gonna like run out and yeah. do that tomorrow. But you know it's, what I it's mean. It's really it's really cool because Saint Jerome actually talks about this very thing, this very thought, in, in, in reference of Peter. So this is like bridges really well together. So he talks about this. He, he says, "The more confident we are of our zeal, which is something that that Peter definitely had. There was something that you definitely talking about, Mister. Sign me up, Mister. Yeah, you know, like I'm all in, guy. Yeah, exactly. The more mistrust we should be of our frailty of flesh." So we should just trust in ourselves less. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. At first, I was reading that backwards, like, mistrust your frailty, which is sort of like a double negative, but yeah. that's not what no. it means. Yeah. Yeah. So then we see Jesus, like, he's comforted by an angel. An angel comes and comforts him, right? Yeah. That's a, which is like that's a just, bizarre... It's a mystery to me. What does it mean to minister to God? I don't... Okay, so why don't you read what St. Bede says? You can, say, you can read right okay. there. Read that to him. St. Bede... Um, it says, in another place, we read that angels came and ministered unto him. Unto him. Right. Like, uh, there's there were times, like, even at the, uh, in the desert, uh, there were several times where, yeah, he, yeah. like, uh, that angels came to Jesus. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to start using the word unto, unto instead of to. Yeah. In testimony, then, of each nature, angels are said both to have ministered to him and confronted him. Uh, comforted. Thank you big difference yes so they were they both ministered and And comforted comforted him him. they didn't confront him i was like all right let's see where this is going (laughs) this is bead this is okay bead getting interesting (laughs) (laughs) so they comforted him for the creator needed not the protection of his creatures but being made man as for our sake he is sad so for our sakes he is comforted yeah so it's it's Mm. it's basically saying like this is again another example for us interesting that is interesting because i've i have like always yeah. wondered like what is what does that mean it's the same thing like i th- like to me you're it's ministering a, it's a, to him it's it, to me it's the same like relationship as like him being baptized yeah like, there's a lot of i like, mean obviously that wasn't like a sacrament but you know like it's what like, you, it's it was like this outward expression at the time of like hey i'm gonna live a better life right or something right yeah it's like oh Really, Jesus, you're gonna you're just gonna turn it around and right. live a better life now, right? But, but I've always kind of assumed when angels came and ministered to him, it was a semantics. You know, like what mm-hmm. does that mean? Sort of like in the Old Testament when you read people saying, "Let us bless the Lord." Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, really? Mm-hmm. You're gonna, yeah? Let's just bless that. Let's. I feel like we can bless him. Mm-hmm. Well, let's bless the Lord because he needs our he needs our blessing. Well, yeah, that's a different. That's you know, a difference. It's, but, that's yeah. a semantic thing. They don't mean that we're right. going to bless the Lord. They mean like we're going to praise the Lord. Right. So I kind of a thought, m- angels ministering to Jesus, uh, I was like, hey, like, I don't know what that means. Right. But I'm sure it's... So this makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm glad to, I'm glad to see yeah. this today. So then he starts sweating blood, which yeah. is crazy, right? Which we find yeah. out from scientifically, like that actually does happen. Yeah. It totally can happen. Right. Now, in every other case, you die. Uh, I don't know if that's true or yeah, not. Yeah. So but... w- when you sweat blood, you're not gonna live. Okay. It, it you have a, you have reached a level of trauma, where you like your body is shutting down. Okay. okay. So like the systems of your body are no longer functioning. That's why blood is oozing out of your pores. Yeah. Now there's uh, there's two schools of thought on this, right? That the writing is is talking about that his sweat was so profuse and so thick and and heavy. That it looked like blood. I don't. That I don't, was not was not truly blood. Like this I, is actually even some some of the actual early church uh, fathers talk about this. 
from yeah. that aspect. I don't buy that. Uh, that's fine. Um, St. Augustine talks about it, and he says, Our Lord praying with bloody sweat represents the martyr martyrdoms which uh, flow from uh, his whole body, which is the church. Mm-hmm. So it was like a prefigurement yeah. of showing, like, listen, the blood of, of the body of the, the, the church grows necessarily through the blood of Christ. Sure, totally. And th- of course, there's all kinds of symbolism here, but I also think that the church fathers who might say, oh, that, you know, it was more of just heavy sweat. It wasn't actually blood. That's probably because the science of the time didn't know that this was actually like a yeah, thing maybe so. That can, that could be that can happen. That could be yeah. You yeah. Know? And so there's, I think you gotta. That has to be a part of that discussion. But yeah. it, it is actually something that can happen. What I see in Christ is that at the agony of the garden, the scourging at the pillar, the crowning with thorns, at each one of these stations. Mm-hmm. Um, is a death. It's it's a suffering in at every moment mm-hmm. that for you and I would have amounted to death. So it was like Christ yeah, dying, dying at over every stage. And over and over, it yeah. was a constant death mm-hmm. that he was living in his passion. Yeah. So it was death at every moment. Okay. So because if you and I sweat blood, we will die. Um, if we had been flogged the way he was flogged, we were nobody's. Yeah. You're not gonna you're not gonna get off the the pillar right. or whatever you were tied to. Um, and even the mystics have revealed, like, that has been revealed to the mystics anyway, that at the crowning of thorns, that some of those were so deep. The needles actually pierced his skull and entered his brain. Okay. Right, yeah. So, once again, you'd be dead. Right. Um, and, or at least not functioning well. R- right. Or you, you were going to die. You're not going right. to, you're not going to carry a cross. Right. After that. Right. right? Um, and so, at each one of those things, it was enough to kill you absolutely yeah uh, so so again so jesus comes back again right this is the second time he goes out and prays he comes back again and the and the apostles are again asleep yeah uh and so why don't you read what origin says about the, the, this is the specific time uh of the second time that that that, that he comes back and they fall asleep here's okay. what origin says. He says and i suppose that the eyes of their body were not so much affected as the eyes of their mind because the spirit was not yet given them. Wherefore, he does not rebuke them, but goes again and prays, teaching us that we should not faint. We should not fate. Is that right? We should not fate? F-A-I-T? Uh, faint, yeah. We should not faint, but should persevere in prayer until we obtain what we have begun to ask. So, yeah. he, so he, again, he's, he, you have to go back again, mm-hmm. right? So Jesus goes back three times to pray, and this is not like... This is very intentional. There's actually something uh, very under like uh, there's a lesson here, right? Shockingly, right? The, the, there's a reason what, why he goes there's back. There's a lesson in what Christ yeah. does, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he goes back three times, and Saint Augustine picks up on this. He says that our Lord prays three times because of his threefold temptation and his passion. That there's three like that he had threefold. There's temptations in his passion. The first one was the temptation of curiosity, uh, opposed to the death of fear, right? Because we were just talking the about the fear this. of death. The fear of death. Right, that the body and the soul, the soul gets weary when the body and soul have. Yeah, death is abhorrent. Right, and, and you get the, weary. The, like the soul and body would be separated. Death, right, it was yeah. never part of the plan. And there's a we're t- not made that way. And the temptation of curiosity there, right, and even in the in, in a yeah. negative sense. Right, a depraved curiosity. Right. Yeah. Um, and then he says the desire to of honor or, or applause uh, is opposed to the dread of this disgrace and insult. Right. So like, there's a. Uh, desire to be honored, and, and obviously he's the king of of all kings. He's the king yeah. of glory. Right. Um, yet he's his creatures are putting him to death. Mm-hmm. So there's a temptation there. Yeah. Obviously, super messed up. Right. And then the, the desire for pleasure, as opposed to the fear of pain. Yeah. So there's three times in which he goes back and prays, and Saint Augustine picks up on this and says, like, uh, he's actually reinforcing, I guess, for for these three things. Interesting. I'm so glad people like him are. Saint Hilary has. The, why don't you read the like next this. one? Where, what Saint Hilary talks about? Because he talks about the, the three giving, as well. You're giving me the long ones here. All right, Saint Hilary. And whereas, when he returned and found them sleeping, he rebukes them the first time. The second time says nothing. The third time bids them take their rest. The interpretation of this is that at the first, that at the first after his resurrection, when he finds them dispersed, distrustful, and timorous, 
he rebukes them. The second time, when their eyes were heavy to look upon the liberty of the gospel, he visited them. He visited them sending them the spirit, the paraclete, for, held back by attachment to the law, they slumbered in respect of faith. But the third time, when he shall come in his glory, he shall restore them to quietness and confidence. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Like the three times. So again, we see the Lord coming back and he rebukes them and says, hey, stay awake. Uh-huh. Like, can you not stay awake with me for one hour? Yeah. Which haunts me all the time. Like, in adoration. In adoration. When you're there for an hour. Right. Yeah. It haunts me all the time. And the second time he sees them again, back asleep, doesn't say anything. He goes back and prays again. And the third time he says, uh, take rest. The hour has come. Mm-hmm. He, he, I think he says, like, are you still taking your rest? It is enough. Or yeah. so, he says something like that. The hour has come. Yeah. And I think that's so beautiful. Like that, that brings to light actually, like what is actually happening in the agony of the garden, mm-hmm. with it, w- in relationship to Peter, James, and John. Yeah, I like how he tied that into after the resurrection. You know, because that's you know after the resurrection, how we should be. Before the resurrection is how we are. Right. Right. And so even afterwards, it's a recognition that even as we should be, there is still an element of journeying and growth right that even if we're not perfect yet that doesn't mean that we're not on the right way yeah um the last thing i want to talk about at least uh that i have here on my notes is saint catherine of siena who is just a boss she is just so epic if you actually okay. read some of the things that she like happened in her life it was it's just astonishing yeah. like some of the things that the lord gave her right the special graces that the lord has gave her and one of the things that, like kind of all the saint catherines are pretty great yeah drexel macaulay i mean they're all like Sienna. if you're a saint catherine like you're doing pretty good yeah exactly yeah so uh so apparently the lord gave saint catherine the like the vision of what he experienced during the gar- the agony of the garden, mm. like, like showed her like this is this is what happened. Yeah, brutal. which would be just terrifying. Yeah, it's, it, that's that's exactly what I, I was sitting here going like I don't want that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> out of all the graces, Lord, out of all the great yeah, graces, can I that pick you something else? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Mister, sign me up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's what I. That's what I mean. <laughs> So uh, she she recants it. So she she talks about this too. I I I believe is her spiritual director who is also a blessed, um, probably because of her. Yeah, most likely. Right. Uh, but so he and he's re, he, he recounts this right. So he's he's telling here's what here's what she told me. He said when he prayed at Gethsemane, let this cup pass for me because this is something that people talk about all the time, right? Oh, the Lord just didn't want to actually do this. Yeah. Right. That he 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 asked the Lord. He asked. God the Father. To not have to die. To not have to die. Yeah. Which is something that is very uh, uh, reasonable as a human being to ask. If I were him. Right. That, I would at least, like, give it a run. Yeah. And he said, but it, not my will. Right. But but thy will. I'm just going to check. Right. Like, hey, I'm still on board, whatever you think. However, if it's, like, possible here, right. I don't know. But this is, St. Catherine says, this is not what he asked. That's not what he's saying. Yeah. Okay. He says, uh, he was not asking for a reprieve from death, but rather that the agony of his incomplete mission might be removed soon by his final passion. Hmm. So, but in obedience, he accepted whatever timing the father might choose, adding, but not uh, what I will, but but what you will. In in St. Catherine's view, Jesus' pain stemmed not from a fear of death, but from the very opposite, from his having something more to suffer. So he was saying, let, like, please let it be now. Right. But that was not the Father's will. Right. You know, it's still very interesting because... Again, this is, this is you don't have to believe this at all. This is uh, private revelation. And so this is something, uh, you can be in uh, complete great standing with the church yeah, uh, but and not believe but this But St. Catherine of Siena. Um, uh, but you have to say that. Yeah. To, well, Yes. Um, it is interesting, though, that, you know, because the hypostatic union is just one of those things that ha- that comes with a lot of mystery for mm-hmm. us, 
that and I did my very best we will to to, to negate a material heresy in this episode yeah, yeah. because oh, yeah. taking on this topic there's uh, opportunity I, there's opportunity oh, for material gosh, heresy there's like some great opportunity yeah for yeah, material. yeah not formal we would never do we'd never that right Look, but material heresy happens. Okay, <laughs> it just sometimes, sometimes it, you you you're in the game long enough. It happens. It happens. Okay? Uh, not um, not not intentionally. I mean, look at Saint Patrick. Okay, <laughs> that's modalism, Patrick. Yeah. But um, just the idea of Christ, what he knew. Okay, like because sometimes it seems pretty clear he's saying this, like from the perspective of his human nature. Mm-hmm. Um, because, and he's, you know, it's like, okay, he's probably saying this for our benefit. He's saying this. So we hear him say it, mm-hmm. uh, because to me, it's like, well, don't you know the father's will? Hey, also, if he's, a, if Peter, James and John keep falling asleep, how do they know what he said? Yeah. How, yes. How do they know? That's exactly right. Mary told him. <laughs> I honestly, I mean, obviously Mary was part, was a huge part of the Gospels. Oh, I think so. Uh, I yeah, mean, especially right. in Luke. I mean, the whole, like, first yeah. couple chapters Narrative. of Luke. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, like. It's like, how do you know this without Mary giving insight? Oh, I mean, yeah, because uh, Joseph was dead before he began his public ministry. Right. Um, also, Mary and John, you know, Mary told St. John. Oh, yeah, like, so Mary's, Mary's uh, input in the Gospel is huge. Right. So, like, maybe she was there quietly in the background like always you know it's like well after you guys fell asleep i thought i should really uh meditate on these things in my heart that my son that my beautiful perfect son was saying my and pierced heart you read exactly and while well, it pained me greatly that you didn't hear them yourself <laughs> i'm overjoyed to share them with you now <laughs> 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 right <laughs> yes um, <laughs> so it's like, well, I'm so disappointed in you that you weren't here to hear this yourself. Right. I'm so of, ecstatic that I get to tell you about it. Out of the immense love for you that I share because of my, because of my son, yeah. right? Because my son loves you and I share that love with, with him right. for you. I was so sad <laughs> that you missed out on these beautiful words that my son said, but praise the Lord yeah. that you're able to receive them now. Yeah. From a vessel so unworthy as myself. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, like, she had to, like, I don't know. I don't know about this particular scene. Anyway, good question. If either are asleep, how do mm-hmm. they know? Maybe the angel who was ministering to Jesus. Or maybe he was, they weren't actually physically asleep. Maybe. Like what the saints were actually Maybe. About. Plot twist. Anyway, I thought this is very interesting because a lot of people, and including myself, when you hear, read the gospel and you read that our Lord says, let this cup pass from me, but not thy will, but your will be done. I insult, like I go, I gravitate towards like the Lord is asking, like, may he not be crucified. Mm-hmm. May he not die. Yeah. I mean, it seems like that's what he says, especially once you know about um, like if you've read about the fourth cup. Right. And, and he knows what's what gonna the happen. cup is. Right. Right. It's that the, the fourth cup comes is associated with the paschal sacrifice right and so the he death knows of the lamb right and he right? knows i'm the lamb i'm the feast of the lamb right? right you know like and so in my mind that's what always i gravitated towards sure you know and once again i think that there's a both and here that uh i think on, you, on a human level does he want to die no he doesn't want to die because but that's part that is ingrained into our nature. Yes. So inescapable. However, that you don't want to die. However, in martyrdom, you know, like you actually do want to die. But that is why it's so, um, it's heroic. Okay. Right. Because those people still feel that the, they don't want to die. But that, this is what happens like whenever your wife, you know, is over there and you know the dishes need to be done and you don't want to get up and go do them. I you, never want to do the but dishes. You, but you choose to get up and go do them yeah. anyway, right? You're choosing a death of right. yourself to go do that. And so if you train yourself to do these things, when the big martyrdom comes, again, this is why like it's so interesting to me that as we're going through Exodus 90 and uh, we're doing the you know cold showers and people act like, I, can't, I just can't do the cold showers. And then, but the same guys... 
uh, will sit there and say like, oh yeah, if I, I would die for my faith. And it's like, hold on, time out. You, you're not willing to take a cold shower for uh, 45 seconds? Yeah. But you're willing to, to die for your faith? The other day, my wife was brushing her teeth. I got in the shower and was out of the shower. Before she finished? Before she was done brushing Same her here. teeth. Same here. That happens to me all. Yeah. Dude, I've, yeah. I've gotten the science of cold showers down pretty well. Yeah. I am in and out with under, like, I think under 30 seconds. I'm not under 30 seconds. I feel good about where I am in my cold shower routine. And that's saying something because I have a lot more hair than you. Yeah. Which takes a lot more time to wash and get yeah. the, the I think soap you out. and I have slightly different approaches. That's okay. But the thing about the, the, uh, the martyrs, yes. you know, and Christ, to say, I think that if we're going to totally discount his desire not to die, I think that we risk, you, you know, you kind of end up in a place, and I'm not saying that's what these saints are doing. Um, cause you, these are, these are just excerpts you from, from their writings. Right. right? So, you, so you, you, you risk, uh, the human nature. Yeah. You discounting the, the fact that he's fully human. Right. Okay. And that f- part of the being fully human in our nature is that human beings were not made to die, mm-hmm. that we were made for life. But if you, death is a result of sin, yeah, that, totally. which is why we all hate it. Right. And so Christ is going to share that hatred for death. In his own person. Sure. So, yes, part of it is I do think he didn't want to die because he's human. Of course, he knew he came to die. He wanted, of course, you know, just like the martyrs who um, pursue a higher good. Right. He, of course, Christ is doing this, knowing full well the glory and and goodness of his mission. Sure. Um, And so in that way, he desired it. Mm -hmm. But still simultaneously because of his his nature didn't want it right he or or had an aversion towards it yeah yeah some kind of like pushback right there's yeah. all, there's this this uh natural like oh i don't want that right i mean just like uh, but, but i understand that uh, the good of fasting the, the good of fasting okay and i fast re- on a regular basis you should it, fast more um well maybe i should but um, no, 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 no you should Okay, I'll, I will, or something. <laughs> you know what? You should fast more. <laughs> I, I, I've started doing that with friends. Like when they talk about fasting, it's like, hey, dude, you should fast more. In fact, I've been meaning to tell you. You should fast more. Yeah. And just see what happens. I, I did this with a, another buddy uh, actually this week. <laughs> right, punch like, you right in the face. <laughs> yeah, they were like, we were just talking. He was like, yeah, I was fasting. I was like, hey, you should fast more. He's like. Yeah, I should. And I was like, no, no, no. And I like, like I mean, like a lot. Like I like I like I gave the the whole dramatic set, like pauses, yeah. right? It's like, no, no, no. More. You you should fast more. <laughs> Next time, you should be like, no, 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 and then act like you're calculating. Look, like, no, like look up to the sky or almost like someone's telling you something. You say, no, 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 and you go down and you you make the sign of the cross right, so, and you nail it. No, 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 wait. Yeah. No, yeah. More. Yeah, like a, yeah. a lot more. <laughs> That's what I'm I'm being told. More. More. Yeah. It it could work. Yeah. So I only recently found out that um the a human being actually can fast for forty like eat no food for forty days. I didn't know. Hmm. And um that the forty days is considered like uh the early range of death. So, like that's the that's like the the low, the lower limit of when you will start to die, is forty days. Hmm. I always took Christ's. I thought it was like fa- seven or eight. Oh, no, 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 without, no, no, without oh, food. no, no, without oh, no, food. no, 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 like, no. You can water, go, you can go a long time, but without food. No, you can only go. You can only go like three days without without water, water right? Yeah. But without food, I thought it was like seven can, or eight days. You can, uh, no, according to a homily. I heard. Okay. okay. So that's my source. By Pope Francis. My source is a homily from a deacon. Okay. I think he's a good... Sm- Which does not rule out Pope Francis. No. No. Because he's still a deacon. Yeah. Uh, no, but there it was, was... It wasn't Pope Francis. I it was, was not Pope Francis. Yeah. Uh, but the, he was saying how... Cardinal Burke. The, <laughs> the lower <laughs> limit 
of death just joking. is 40 days. And so if you just, and obviously it depends on who you are. If you've got a little bit, uh, if you're little carrying bit more, if you're carrying a little bit more soft flesh around, yeah. you can put, you can make it longer. If, if you're, if you're like a, an athlete, if you, if you're walking around at like 7% which, body which fat, grace perfects nature, the more nature that you have. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what it means, but <laughs> you know. So obviously, there. But that was 40 days. I, I thought it was always a, um, you know, metaphor. A metaphor, right? Or just for a long time, because you you know the the word 40 in in the Bible. But actually, after hearing his homily, it made me think that he probably actually did it mm-hmm. for for 40 days. He probably ate nothing. Which would be crazy. Have you? What's yeah. the longest you've ever gone without eating? Oh, like no food at all. Zero. I think, uh, just a hair over twenty four hours. So in high school, did you have Coughlin in high school? Yeah. Did you have to do the fasting thing? Remember, he he part of his uh, like junior level class was that you went. 48 hour a whole 48 hours without eating no so i had him and i um made it i almost made it the thing was we were we would stop eating at his class one day and then two days later we would have like a feast in his class my job was to pick up donuts on the way to school your will was so weak and i could smell these donuts in the back on the way to class, I had Come him like on. second. I had him like second period, right? I was so close, and I and before we got to before we got to class, I was like, "Give me one of those donuts." I was so hungry, and I ate one. It's and, interesting how how your will, like what your will does. Oh, like, dude, yeah. yeah. And uh, but that's I the, mean that's the longest I've ever gone. But I've gone I've gone crazy amounts of times on very little food. Yeah, but a little bit of food actually goes a long way I, so like in high school i wrestled uh-huh and like i would We're pull, trying to cut weight yeah i'd pull like uh so in high like, you know i'm not i'm not a thick guy uh, i'm pretty lean um and and senior year of high school would you wrestle at well senior year of high school you were, you were a lot bigger back then yeah also. uh when i when i walked into the wrestling room uh i was like 178 and i wrestled at 152 that's a big like that is yeah it's a lot that's uh, for my senior year I and mean, that that's a that's a lot of weight you know 30 pounds is a lot of weight mm-hmm. um and so i would go you know multiple days on just a little bit of food just like yeah. a like a hair you know just a little bit of it food. goes but it can go a long way i mean if yeah, you, but it's still is oh, not dude, well, totally fun sucks, yeah yeah it's not easy yeah but uh yeah anyway i just thought that was interesting that, that is interesting, yeah. Once again, another example of Christ basically going to death. Yeah. Embracing, de- like, that death is this companion of his. Yeah. That he's walking around with. Yeah. And and I don't want to... Because this is his end. He knows what his, like, what he's here for. Right. Well, he came to conquer that. Yeah. Um, and, and we don't have to get into this today, but... Let's get into it. No, I'm just... Of all of the um, sorrowful mysteries... Yeah. The one that I think would be the hardest, not that it's the most painful by any means, but I just think the hardest would be the carrying of the cross. From a physical aspect? No. Because um, the all of the other ones, just from a natural level, are being done to him. Okay, you're you're tied to a post and you're being you're being lashed. Mm-hmm. You're being crucified. Not the agony of the garden. The agony of the garden is, is like He's not it, like okay. Well, like hey, he's dealing with rejection. Yeah, it, it's it's just happening to him. Okay, he just loves and you and you. The well, reason there's is a di- there's a difference there a difference in the agony like compared to like the scourging of the pillar or things like that because like he can leave in the agony of the garden. Well, right, but still, like you're he, tied to a pillar. He can't escape the rejection. The rejection is just a reality. That he has no choice but okay. to deal with, right? Mm-hmm. The the thing that's unique about the carrying of the cross is that it was up to his human will mm-hmm. to take one more step 
every single time. time. It was his, it, like the only thing that made it happen yeah. was his decision to yeah. do it, yeah. right? Whereas like when you're on the cross, someone's holding your hand down and driving a nail through your hand, okay? Like that's totally oof. bad, totally. But it's a it's a distinction. Totally bad? Totally bad. <laughs> I said totally. It Todos. It means completely. Okay. okay. It means that there's. It's all there. <laughs> completely. All the badness is there. But when you're carrying that cross, you know it's up to you. Yeah. To will yourself to take that next step, which is a totally different thing. It would be yeah. so hard yeah. to Physically, do. Physically, mentally, psychologically. Yeah. yeah. Because I you know. Mentally and psychologically. You know, like all right, uh, all of the other ones, t- like time will pass and it will be over. Yeah, the only way to get the carrying of the cross over is for you is to make yourself do it. Take another step, and then another step. You know, and like you are the only one yeah. who can accomplish this task. Completely dehydrated and like right after having like, right been been uh, sweating blood, uh, been like basically whipped to death. Twenty four hours after, and then like, thorns in your brain, and twenty four hours after like having anything to eat. Yeah, n- yeah, nothing to eat or drink. Yeah, and like oh yeah. And, and like still getting whipped along the way. Anyway, that's just yeah. I th- uh, yeah. I just so let me ask you this. Uh, guy asks like, okay, what what should I do to make this week like uh, more efficacious on my end? Mm-hmm. What would you, what would you suggest? Because we we've talked yeah. about like watching the Passion, reading reading uh, the Gospels of of the Passion. Do you have any other suggestions? Yeah. So I do. I would say really think about what your schedule look like, okay? Um, because the, uh, once again, if you really think about it, everything we've talked about today is this association between activities and the soul, that Jesus is doing something, and what does that mean for, like, his interior disposition, right? That there is these different senses of Scripture, right? And and basically, those different senses of Scripture are Ba- all being played out in the person of Christ as he's going through the Gospels, right? And so those same principles apply to us in our daily life. So it's Holy Week. Think about your schedule. Um, this is uh, this is just this is my opinion. This is not the week for having people over. Okay, this this is not um, this week of all the weeks of the, there's 51 other weeks this year. Okay. This is not the week to be doing those kinds of things. This is a week for solitude. So I, I, I think it's a week for, look at what your work schedule is. Um, if you can, I think you should be doing all that you can to work work less and have time for meditation. Um, not everybody has the luxury of being able to take Good Friday off. If you... If you have uh, the time, vacation time, take Good Friday off every year. Put it on your calendar, okay? We don't work on Good Friday for those of us who can. Some people don't have a choice, right? Right. Um, but we just we, we want to do what we can during Holy Week. That way we can make ourselves present at the liturgies that happen. Attend. You want to attend all the liturgies this week, um, all that are available, Um the chrism. If you have small children, the chrism mass can be maybe a challenge. I guess it's like an hour and a half, two hours long. Yeah, and sometimes it's late in the evening. And um, but you want to just be present for um, the, the, like of all of the year, all of the weeks throughout the year. This is the one for meditation. This is the one for confession. Mm-hmm. So definitely, e- even if you went to confession yesterday, like go again. Like really think hard on your sins, think hard about it. all of the shortcomings we have every day. Okay, like John Paul II went to confession every day, and he's probably like way better than us, way better than you, you know, whoever you are. Um, so that that's what I would say is lean into the sacraments, really think about your schedule this week, and what is essential as we really want to take advantage of the graces that Holy Week offers to us. Um, And this ponderance, because doing Holy Week well will be the key ingredient to doing Easter well. Okay, the better we do Holy Week, 
the more we enter into Christ's passion and meditation, mm-hmm. um, and the more we realize how like our our part in His passion, and we all it's like it's me. The reason He's doing all these things is is I did it. I did that to Him. Mm-hmm. Um, so the more we can have time and leisure to enter into those. Um, you know, the, these like sacred profound, the, these sacred mysteries. Yes, exactly. And just really um, relish them, be thankful for them. The better we will be in Easter because we're, we are an Easter people. We're not a, we're not a Holy Week people. We're actually an Easter people. Okay? okay. We're not all about Holy Week. Holy Week, though, is essential to understanding the goodness of Easter. Yeah. And because we're so into Easter, we need to do Holy Week well. That's right. Yeah, that was going to be my suggestion as well. Is like make sure to try to take off fri- oh, a good Friday. Uh huh. And if you can't, Holy Thursday. I yeah. Um, you know, compromise half day on Holy Thursday. I think that's a. However you want, however you can what, whatever you can do. But but like uh and and really like go to Station of the Cross at three p.m. on Fridays. Uh, have Friday look different in your home. That's what I was trying to get at right there, is uh, that the whole week should be different. That's what I meant. Look at your schedule. I'm glad you said it, said it that way. That's obvious. It's a pretty obvious way to put it. But you, you but nailed why, it, Adam. Why do it the obvious way when you do it the roundabout right. way? Right. Like John Paul II. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He was always doing that. John Paul, get to the point. Um, but yes, this week should be different from all the other weeks. Your kids should know it's different. Yeah. Um, like this is not a week for dessert. This is this is a week of austerity, mm-hmm. right? And it, it should be a penitential week. Um, it, it's it's a and the, because those penances they help us connect. We have so many comforts, and all those comforts do are distract us from really connecting with the passion. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's what I would say. I think it's good. Yeah. I'm so excited to be at Easter people. Yeah, dude, I'm I'm ready for it to be over. <laughs> I'm excited. What an but opportunity. But thy will be done. What an opportunity. But thy will be done. To like love the Lord. Yeah. Every moment. That's right. Especially Easter. <laughs>